can we feel present both in books and in virtuality? And is being present in a book the same as feeling present in virtuality? And if that's the case, should we merge both accounts and have an integrative overarching perspective on both concepts? These are questions that we want to address in this presentation. And we, that is my colleague, Miguel Barreda, and me, Thilo Hartmann, uh, Professor for Virtuality at the FU Amsterdam. Virtual reality is a, a part of a bigger group of immersive technologies, like for example, there's also augmented reality. But in this presentation, we only focus on virtual reality. And with virtual reality, we mean that people like on this picture, they wear a head mounted display, which shields in a way their eyes. And also they wear headphones, which cover their ears. Uh, and so uh, the sensory input, the visual input and the auditory input they receive is completely driven by a computer. They are completely away from the actual world and immersed in a virtual world. And what is most important here is that the computer also tracks the head and body and hand movement and therefore can actually display the correct sensory uh, uh, sensation um, uh, that fits to the motoric behavior of the user. So that if you turn your head, you get a correct and fitting visual impression. Also, the spatial sound adapts to your movement of the ears in space. And because of this, virtual reality can evoke what we call presence. And in this presentation, what we address is sensory presence. This is a strong perception and perceptual sensation of being physically present in the virtual environment. At the same time, what is currently happening is that uh, there's a, a, a stronger interest in also telling stories in virtual reality, uh, which can be addressed as immersive storytelling, so that people are immersed in VR, and at the same time, they are part of follower story or even taking actively part in, in, in acting a story. Um, and uh, here, uh, well, the producers still search for the right way, or developers still search for the right way how to tell good immersive stories um, in VR. Uh, mostly all agree that presence is again a very important sensation, a user sensation within the experience. So that the, the, the say the power of the story can really unfold also because people feel presence in the virtual environment at the same time. Now we of course know that also users can feel present in other media. Uh, and, and particularly uh, while reading a book and if they feel transported into a story and therefore feel what uh, scholars address as narrative presence. So narrative presence can be defined, uh, and I follow here Bissell and Bilancic, as a sensation of being present in a narrative world due to comprehension processes in perspective taking. Now, this uh, uh, phenomenon or user sensation puzzled actually or still puzzles VR scholars because they wonder uh, uh, if uh, feeling present in a book is actually the same as feeling present in a virtual environment. And they address this as a book problem. And we see, while there's not so much, I would say, that happened actually in the community of virtual reality scholars uh, to integrate these two phenomena, but we see actually more integrative accounts that have already been proposed in literature studies. And the first step, I like to compare sensory presence and narrative presence and the phenomenological aspects of both sensations. So sensory presence is triggered by immersive technology and narrative presence is triggered by getting engaged with the narrative. But the sensation we uh, describe both in the same way because it's both about feeling spatially, physically located in the world or in the scenery or in the space that is depicted either by the virtual reality and by, uh, virtual reality or by the narrative. Both require focused attention. So people really have to pay full attention to either say the virtual uh, environment or to the narrative to feel the present sensation. If you look at the input, both of course require an external input. So the virtual reality device they had on the display and the headphones or say a book uh, uh, with text or with language. So, uh, but uh, here's a slight difference in that uh, for virtual reality, uh, what is essential is that the sensory input, the external sensory input like visual or auditory uh, uh, input matches the uh, what the, uh, the expected 
uh, input that the so the input that the user expects and this is actually part of a bigger cognitive uh, theory of framework that argues that any kind of motor action like if you move your hand or hands or your body uh, any kind of motor action actually comes automatically with a certain expectation of what kind of sensory input that should uh, sensory uh, experience that should generate or should uh, be accompanied, uh, accompanied with. And then um, uh, so the actual external sensory input that is received is compared to the expected sensory input and only the error, the, the, mis the, 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 the residuals are actually communicated back to higher regions of the brain. Uh, but if there's not much error in a way, then uh, in a very quick and smooth way, uh, perception arises and the outer world is in a way uh, construed. And so for sensory presence to arise, indeed scholars say that these kind of sensory motor contingencies have to be fulfilled. Now, if you look at narrative presence, it's uh, it's similar because the, the, of course there's text, but the text is translated into some sort of embodied simulation so that if people read, for example, about that a protagonist opens the door, uh, so very common, motoric action, uh, they at the same time simulate how it would be to open the door and they have all the full, the full uh, sensory associations that come with uh, uh, this action of opening the door. They don't enact this action, but they simulate it in, in, a, in a kind of embodied simulation. Uh, and in, in that sense, um, so um, many of the sensory experience are uh, uh, identical or highly similar and we compare sensory presence and narrative presence. If we look at the role of action, um, then we see that uh, for sensory presence, we are indeed acting, really acting, like grasping something, moving ahead is center mount is really important for presence to arise. And we also see that users also dare to enact, so they grasp, they try to act, if you look at the table, they try to grasp the table. The narrative presence, Action is also important. And here I refer to a very important account of Kuzmikova. Um, uh, action is also very important because Kuzmikova argues uh, in a narrative, especially those parts that depict common action, common motoric behavior, like opening a door, grasping a pen or a cup. Um, th these are the parts that actually evoke uh, narrative presence. So it's in this moment, you feel like, narratively present. And uh, so and that feeds, of course, that links back to this embodied simulation that I already addressed. So action is also very important for narrative presence to arise. The only difference is we don't enact things ourselves as readers. So we don't try to open a door, of course, if we read a book, we don't uh, f uh, execute the motoric action ourselves. When we address something, what I would call mind-body, so uh, then I would say in sensory presence, we are both the mind and the body are fully present. For example, for presence in VR, it's really important that people feel like their actual, their virtual body is their actual body, something we call self-presence. And so, uh, and of course, with the attentional focus, also the mind is fully present uh, in the environment. Uh, in narrative presence, um, I'm not totally sure. I mean, on the one hand, we have an embodied simulation, which is driven by the mind. You could say both mind and body are fully engaged and in a way present in the experience. But on the other hand, if you look at, for example, the scale by Bussell and, uh, and, and Bilancic to measure narrative presence, there's also items uh, uh, like, for example, that I was aware I, I, I felt my mind was present in the narrative while I knew my body was present in the living room. So there was still, still certain decoupling of mind and body uh, and maybe stronger awareness that the body is actually still, the physical body is still in the real world. If we look at robustness, also here I see perhaps slight differences in that sensory presence in VR is really a permanent thing. So once the head mounted display is put on, you feel present. If you want it or not, it's a highly automatic perception. And only if certain sensory laws are not uh, uh, supported, then there are breaks in presence. But if there are semantic inconsistencies, like so this house doesn't look like a real house, like a proper house, then I don't think 
spatial presence in VR is broken. Uh, but in narrative presence, that might be a bit more fleeting and fragile. First of all, fleeting because it might only occur, for example, in these, like uh, Kuzmikov says, like in these fragments that are about motoric action, uh, when you read about those. Uh, and it might be fragile because if there's inconsistencies, uh, um, uh, like all so sorts of uh, semantic inconsistencies or, or logical fallacies, uh, like inconsistent stories, um, uh, in uh, inconsistencies within the story, then these might be sufficient to already break perhaps the narrative presence experience. I already pointed out to the important uh, account by Aneska Kuzmikova, who argues that implied simple bodily actions and movement are actually central in evoking narrative presence. So another uh, and more recent uh, important integrative account has been proposed by Federico Bianzola and colleagues. And they argue uh, that if you pay attention to uh, a medium like a narrative or virtuality, you start to get engaged as an embodied user. So also here, there's this parallel to what Aneska Kuzmikova would argue. Um, and, and so when you get engaged as an embodied user, then what is important is the way how your body responds in, uh, in the exposure moment. Um, so when taking in a scene that is depicted either by a narrative or by a virtuality, uh, they argue we preconceive what the scene affords to us, like action possibilities. Uh, and we also preconceive how uh, bodily responses that are linked to these action possibilities. So as a user, once you pay attention to uh, the environment or narrative, you thus automatically unconsciously develop implicit embodied predictions. So predictions about potential sensory or inner bodily physical states. Uh, they argue that as a user, you can develop explicit or conscious embodied predictions as well by formulating intentions to which again, presumed responses are attached. These embodied predictions, implicit or not, can eventually be met to a different degree by the attended stimulus, so by the narrative of virtual reality uh, technology. If they are not met, they give rise to a so-called prediction error but according to Pian Sola and colleagues, presence emerges, so that's the most important thing here, when people can enact intuitively, so without much prediction error and without the necessary involvement of reasoning, um, their implicit or explicit embodied predictions about possible action in the depicted space. Um, and what is now maybe most central to the approach is that based on this common mechanism, where I still see many similarities in a way to the uh, account by Aneska Kuzmikova, uh, Pianzola and colleagues argue that uh, people focus in their attention on different responses. Uh, so uh, in either narratives or when they engage with an external device like a, a reality, uh, virtual reality headset. So if using a device like virtual reality headset, you, according to the count, you pay attention to external feedback, to sensory feedback. So this sensory feedback combines exterioreception and proprioception and muscular and vestibular feedback. And uh, the idea is here that because of the focused attention on it, uh, the feedback must be most accurate. So prediction errors must be uh, very small in order to uh, or to work, in order for a sensory presence to emerge. Um, at the same time, people are not so much paying attention to other prediction errors. Because in contrast to uh, a virtual reality headset, if you're using a device like a book or follow a narrative, according to this account, you pay particular attention to internal feedback, to internal bodily responses, interoceptive feedback, which focuses on physiological states like arousal or emotions. So in a nutshell, uh, uh, this uh, new approach argues that based on a common mechanism, namely, namely embodied predictions, uh, a narrative presence can arise when engaged in narratives because of uh, a say, sort of intentional focus and, 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 and uh, formulated expectations regarding internal feedback, interoceptive feedback, while sensory presence in VR can arise based on the same mechanism with a, a stronger focus on external feedback or extra reception. But uh, what is important is that presence in both cases arise when embodied predictions that are 
uh, linked to uh, perceived action possibilities are intuitively so error-free and smoothly supported. Hello, I am Miguel Barreda. I am a researcher at Telefonica Research in Barcelona. And in this uh, third part of the presentation, I'd like to, to, to point out some practical aspects of, of experiencing the, these two types of presence, uh, sensory and narrative presence, uh, at the same time when, when we are watching a story in, in VR, an immersive narrative in VR. If you are uh, familiar with the, with the recent history of VR, you probably know that uh, a few years ago, many companies started creating narratives in VR, in most cases using 360 video. And when, when they were uh, advertising these, uh, these stories, uh, there was usually one, uh, one, one, the same message that we can improve a good uh, story by making the viewers feel a sensory presence. Uh, making the viewers feel that they are there inside the story, that they are placed in the, in the virtual environment. And this way, we, the, the, this message suggests that this way we can make the story more compelling or more moving or more um, persuasive. This uh, actually, uh, this is assuming that, that we can add a layer of sensory presence on top of the narrative presence that the viewer gets from the story. However, when researchers, including myself, when we have started exploring uh, this idea empirically, um, and the results that we that we that we got, they actually uh, point in a in a different direction. They suggest that in practice, uh, at least in many cases, uh, these two types of presence uh, maybe they are not fully compatible, or maybe even one can detract from from the other. And the, the reason for this is because of the of the dynamics of, of, of the attention of the viewers when they are when they are watching these these stories. First, uh, when the viewer uh, when the viewers feel that they are in a, in, a, in a virtual environment, they they actually want to know where they are. So they they tend to to explore the environment. They they look in different directions uh, to uh, to to understand where where they are. And that, in practice, that can distract the viewer from from the from the from the content of the story, and make the viewer less engaged with the with the story. Um, there are several studies uh, pointing in this direction, uh, including some conducted by by myself. Um, the results show that uh, that often, when the viewers feel a sensory presence. This is associated with uh, remembering less information from the story or having a, a worse understanding of, of, of the events in the story. Second, uh, but also related, uh, there is a question of the, of the cognitive demands of the, of the story. The, the VR environment can be very, very cognitively taxing for, for the viewer. In VR, we have a, a very wide field of view. It's full of details, and we know that our uh, attentional capacity is limited. So this, the, uh, the, the vivid, vividness of the story, that the, the visual richness of, of the of the VR environment, it uh, it can, on the one hand, it contributes to to sensory presence, but at the same time, it can make it hard for the viewer to, to really pay attention to the, to the story. It can overload the the, the cognitive capacity of the of the viewer and as a result the viewer can be less engaged with the story or feel less uh, transported into, into the story and there is uh, also a, a, an extra reason uh, or a, an, another question that uh, on top of the reasons that I've mentioned before it is uh, about the about if we if about if there is a maximum level of presence that we, that we can feel with, when when experiencing uh, an immersive narrative, for instance, uh, imagine a situation uh, where the viewers already feel very present in the in the environment uh, because of a because of a strong uh, sensory stimulation, like in this uh, example. And uh, in a case like this, can the viewers feel even more present uh, if the if the story told is good? Our intuition is that there must be some ceiling in the level of presence that one that one can feel in general, uh, and that, that that means that when one type of presence is at the maximum, 
probably we cannot just increase the, the other type. We cannot reach a super presence uh, when the when the level of either either narrative or or sensory presence is already very, very high. So uh, as a conclusion for this part, it seems that the, although the two types of presence are they, they are they based on on similar mechanisms, they may not be uh, fully compatible in practice, and it's uh, it's it's important to understand to what extent they are compatible or not, or in which specific cases they, they can be compatible or not, uh, because it, this is basic to really uh, to really understanding what it means to be to be present in a narrative. So these uh, these are still open questions that will require more research in the in the future. To conclude, we uh, compared sensory present to narrative presence in this presentation. Uh, both are tackled in actually two separate fields: uh, the research on virtual reality or immersive technologies on one hand, and literature studies or studies on narratives on the other hand. Uh, yet both root in the same cognitive mechanisms. Uh, and there's the first integrative accounts that have been proposed um, uh, to actually combine both fields or both concepts. Perhaps both concepts still differ in the perceptual presence quality and robustness. And with that, I mean, uh, so that, for example, narrative presence may be a bit more fragile uh, and perhaps a little bit less intense uh, than sensory presence. Uh, in immersive storytelling, as we have seen in the last part of the presentation, also triggering both sensory and narrative presence at the same time might encounter attentional conflicts so that people can either pay attention to one or the other at the cost of the other uh, phenomenon. Thank you very much for listening.